Hi, and welcome to Listening Week. Hi to everybody joining us on Facebook and YouTube, as well as those seeing the stream through the official OET Telegram channel. It's great to have you here. And every day this week, we are running live sessions, all focusing on listening. So here is the agenda for this week. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be focusing all about the listening skills and effective ways that you can be a successful listener. Tomorrow, which is Tuesday, we will focus on listening part A, looking at the questions from the new sample test, going through the answers submitted by candidates in advance and discussing which are correct, incorrect and why. On Wednesday, we'll do the same with part B, thinking about strategies for answering multiple choice questions. Thursday is the turn of part C. And finally, on Friday, we'll bring it all together and look at how you can make use of all the content we've gone through this week and your sample test answers to improve your listening skills further as you continue to pre prepare for your test. All of the sessions this week are relevant for all candidates because OET professions all take the same listening test. We're also recording all of this week's session, so if you do miss one, you'll be able to catch up straight after the session finishes. And at the end of the week, we'll also turn all five sessions into a playlist so you can access them in one handy location. For those of you who didn't catch Reading Week earlier this year, we're sharing the playlist link, including the additional videos we've recently added going through each Reading Part C question in detail into the chat now. And keep an eye on the chat as we go through today's session. We'll be posting links to things that I mentioned, some useful resources, ways that you can prepare into the chats, and it's also your way to interact with me. And speaking of which, I'm going to make these sessions as interactive as possible. I'm going to be asking for your opinions, reading your comments as we go along. So please make use of the comment boxes on your social media channel. And let's practice now. So here's the question, a really simple one to get everybody started. Um, have you tried an official OET listening sample test before? So choosing yes or no. Uh, I'm expecting most of you will be saying yes here. You've tried at least one of the sample tests available on the OET website. But if you're new to OET, absolutely fine. If you haven't tried one already, you'll find out everything you need to know about taking an OET sample test uh, during the course of this week. But I can see overwhelmingly the answers coming through uh, that everyone saying yes so far. So that's great. Everyone has a fair idea of uh, what a sample test looks like. And no doubt you're here to get some tips and strategies about how to improve your score, which is great. Here's a second question. This one is multiple choice. How frequently do you listen for 20 minutes or more? So tell me in chat, A, B or C. Uh, a is once a week or less. B is three to four times a week, or C is every day. Um, feel free to be honest. I'm not going to judge you for your answer here. So A, B, or C, once a week or less, three or four times a week, or every day. All right, let's have a look. Some C's and A's coming through. A couple of B's as well, but mostly mostly A's and C's, I think, coming through. So um, that's great if you're one of those person who's people saying that they listen at least 20 minutes a day. But I also respect those who have honestly answered and said that they are uh, an A or a B. But now everyone's warmed up. Let's get started on today's Listening Week session. So listening is something of an enigma compared to the other skills of reading, writing and speaking, where it's quite simple for you to provide a commentary of what you're thinking and doing at any given moment to answer a question or complete a task. Providing a commentary for listening can't be done smoothly as it would mean talking over the top of the voice speaking, missing what's being said, or you'd have to stop and start the recording repetitively, which isn't representative of how we listen. And as teachers, it can be difficult to assist students to improve their listening skills because we cannot see what you are doing. And frequently students maintain that they've 
understood everything in the recording, so are at a loss to explain why they answered so many questions incorrectly, or they didn't able to answer a question at all. And for you as students, listening can be an area which you feel insecure about, especially when you feel like you're not making much noticeable practice and progress, sorry. And the impact of this is that students tend to avoid practicing listening because of this insecurity that they may feel about it. So what does it mean to listen? At a basic level, listening means listening to sounds and understanding what those sounds mean. Is it information? Am I listening to a question that I need to respond to? Is it an instruction that I need to follow? And then from that rudimentary level of just listening to sounds, your listening increases to understanding details or a sequence of information, understanding the main idea that's being communicated, to being able to analyze what's being said for relevance. Is it fact or opinion to the point where we're listening purely for pleasure to audio books, theater and so forth. And a lot of what we do when we listen is automatic. So I want you to think about um, a, a skill where you've had to uh, learn something that took a lot of your attention initially, like learning to drive. When you first learn to drive, if you can remember this, I, I know I can, you feel like your body is being called to do many things at once. And you, you look perhaps a little bit like the woman in this picture. And all your senses are being used at the same time, not least listening to the instructions of the person who's teaching you and trying to execute those instructions while you are listening. And it can feel when you've been learning to drive for a little while that this is always how driving is going to feel, slightly chaotic and reactive. But then slowly but surely, um, it starts to become um, much more familiar. And perhaps after you've been driving for a while on your own, um, you relax a bit, you settle into the skills until they become the automatic responses that most of us are now able to do as we're driving. And listening is the same. When we listen in our first or primary language, the processes are automatic. We're hearing the words and processing the meaning and implications of the message at the same time. But when we listen in a second language, we go through the learning to drive feelings of chaos and reactiveness. We're seeking out words that we recognize and clutching onto those to try to help us fill in the gaps. And again, like driving, to reach the state of the automatic processes in the second language, we need to practice frequently and to a variety of recordings and speakers just as we had to practice driving in different types of weather and on different road types. So in your progress of learning English today, you have moved from that sort of initial chaotic um, being able to recognize the occasional word and building up an imperfect idea of what's been said to being able to do this automatically for chunks of words in speech. And now you're able to start thinking about what the speaker is saying why they're saying it, and to follow lines of argument and thought. And this is great. This is a huge achievement, the way that you're able to listen in another language and to that ability. But are you ever left wondering why after all these years of learning English, you still find understanding speakers of English hard when you're having a conversation, or why some recordings seem particularly difficult to follow? Now, part of this is to do with your perception about the speaker, including their accent. And we'll return to accents and strategies for understanding unfamiliar accents more easily on Friday. But the other part is how natural speech occurs. Because unlike when you read, where you can see the words that have been written and edited into sentences with your clarity in mind, when you listen, the speaker produces a stream of sound that disappears as quickly as it's produced. Three words a second is normal. And words that you might know really well when written down often sound different when pronounced and particularly when said as part of a chunk of speech. And so it's very easy for you to be distracted by competing demands of unfamiliar vocabulary, 
pronunciation, grammatical structure, and because you don't know when the end of the speech is coming. This happens more in unplanned speech like conversations, so part A and B of OET, but less in rehearsed speech like presentations or interviews, which is what you get in part C of OET, because generally in part C in these kinds of uh, listening audios, speakers are aware of needing to take listeners through the content of their speech more slowly as it's likely to be new to them and they will have rehearsed their speech incorporating pauses for clarity and emphasis. But let me give you three examples of features of unplanned speech that might be causing you trouble in parts A and B. So the first one is that speakers take shortcuts when producing speech because when speaking at natural sound, at natural speed, sorry, it's hard to move our mouths quickly enough to form each individual sound. And here are three examples when sounds get chopped off words. So the first one was used to instead of was used to, hadn't been instead of hadn't been and a bit tired instead of a bit tired. The second example is that speakers don't always pronounce all of the words. So English is a stress time language, meaning the important words are pronounced more clearly and other words might be pushed into the ends or beginning of those more important words or perhaps not said at all. And here are three more examples. So worse and worse instead of worse and worse, going to the gym instead of going to the gym, and due to go home instead of due to go home. <laughs> it sounds quite funny when I say it like that, but that's the difference between English. We stress the important words and push together those other little words that aren't so important to the meaning. And the third ex example is that speakers don't leave clear gaps between words like those that exist in writing, meaning that you, the listener, have to work out where one word ends and the next one begins. And here are three final examples. So he sat university instead of he's at university. My ankles instead of my ankles. And has her own instead of has her own. So successful listeners know to pay attention to these features of speech and improve their ability to do so by spending time after they've listened to something listening again to problematic chunks of speech they've just heard by saying those chunks aloud, mimicking the pronunciation as well as using the chunks in their own speech. And there's a proven link between higher listening comprehension and learners who have actively tried out newly noticed language orally. And later in the session, I'll recommend some useful listening resources you can use for practice Many of these come with scripts like OET sample tests, or you can turn subtitles on when you listen a second time so you can see the words on the screen at the same time. And just be aware that subtitles are not usually 100% accurate. So let's look at three listening skills you can easily develop to improve your comprehension and comfort at getting the information you need from the speaker or in a recording. The first skill is using your world knowledge to help predict and anticipate what you are about to hear. A lot of spoken interactions follow set patterns and language associated um, with the type of conversation or speech. We learn these patterns and language sets by observing and participating in the world around us and from listening and watching content on the radio, the TV and internet. These situational conventions exist in every language and are often the same, but just with different words. So let's think about the context of the dentist. So think about making a dental appointment. Immediately, just from thinking about making a dental appointment, immediately you know the following information about the conversation. You know the setting. 
either in person at the dentist's office or on the phone. You know the participants, the dental receptionist and yourself. You know the goals of the conversation to arrange an appointment and you know the outcomes, a date and a time for your appointment. And finally, you also know some typical language that you can expect in this conversation. Words like available, unavailable, earlier, later, checkup. It's all very standard. So when listening to such a conversation, what you're actually listening for is to confirm your expectations and to fill in the exact details. For, in other words, the appointment date and time. And this is how the conversation plays out, which you know in advance. You phone the dental receptionist and exchange greetings. Then you explain the purpose of your call is to make an appointment. The receptionist offers you an appointment and you accept or reject it, instead stating a preference for a time of day or day of the week that would be convenient to you. The receptionist offers another appointment and the process of accepting or rejecting continues until you are satisfied with the appointment time. The receptionist confirms the detail of your appointment with your named dentist and you use polite language to close the conversation. So in OET, the context of what you are listening to is always provided. Here are some examples. You hear a consultant gastroenterologist talking to a patient called Vincent Sykes. You hear a pharmacist talking to a customer who's in pain. You hear a cardiologist updating hospital colleagues about trials of urine testing. You hear a microbiologist called Dr. Jane Finn giving a presentation about the overuse of antibiotics. Let's try a quick exercise and to get you involved again in the session. So I'm going to show you a short description of a podcast or YouTube video and I want you to tell me in chat what you think the setting, participant, goals and outcomes are, as well as three words you think the speaker or speakers might use in the first five minutes of the recording. Let's look at one as an example. So here's the description that you might see on YouTube, for example, or to describe a podcast. It's about uh, Dr. Ward talking to a patient who has a frozen shoulder. So we know that the setting is going to be at some kind of medical clinic, just from reading that description. We know that the participants are the doctor and their patient. We know that the goal is to discuss the progress since the patient's first injection and the outcome will be to give the second injection and some suggestions of words that they might use in the first five minutes are uncomfortable, restricted, difficulty, frustrated, and sleep. So now I want you to try. Here's the next description, and I want you to let me know in chat what you can already anticipate about the conversation just by reading the context of it. So you might be able to answer one or more of those um, headings that I've got there in uh, light blue. So setting, participants, goal, outcome, and words that you expect to hear. Let me know in chat what you think uh, you can anticipate about that audio um, to answer any of those headings. What would the setting be, do you think? Who are the participants? What is the goal of this? audio? Uh, what is the outcome going to be? And what are some typical words that the speaker or speakers might use in the first five minutes? All right, we've got a few answers coming through. Suggestions that the setting might be a clinic. I don't think this conversation is going to be based in a clinic. Um, the, 
the the language choices here seem a little bit formal compared to the one uh, where we had Dr. Ward talking to their patient. Um, Nana is suggesting a podcast. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Or Alexia says perhaps a presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. Anu is saying the participant is um, the creative investigator. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good idea. Um, Mubeen Khalid is suggesting this might be um, an interview um, between or a seminar or even a lecture from Ariel. Very good. Yeah, some nice ideas about the setting and the participants. Can you think of any words that the speaker um, might use in the first five minutes or what the goal of this um, pr presentation or podcast might be? What, what do you think um, the speaker wants us to learn as an outcome of this uh, presentation? Just give you another 20 seconds. See if you can answer any of those ideas for goal, outcome, or words. Thanks for that suggestion, Haley. So the goal might be how to ask correct questions while interviewing patients. Yeah, Anna suggests that uh, the speaker might be arguing that seeing is different uh, to looking. Yep. And Nana is suggesting the speaker might say disease, medication, signs. Alexia is saying the goal might be to compare things or create awareness from Edith. Yeah, great. Okay, good ideas. All right, so these were my suggestions. Um, a lot of you said something similar, so this might be a webinar or a live um, participation um, venue, um, so like a TED Talk or a podcast. The participants, we've just got the one speaker for this um, audio. And the goal is to share research, so somebody said to inform, um, that was a, a good option. And the outcome is that the audience are going to be informed and will improve their questioning technique, which was another suggestion coming through from an attendee, so well done. Some idea of words, uh, maybe question related words, so asking or answers. Um, doctors uh, might be another uh, word they use, time, because uh, time to ask questions uh, often is an, an issue for healthcare professionals and fail when, when we don't ask the correct questions. Let's try one more. Here's this one's quite a different kind of description. Again, see what you can do in terms of uh, coming up with what the setting might be, who the participants are, what the goal, the outcome, and words are for this description. Just from reading that brief description of an audio, what can you anticipate that you would hear um, when you listened to this recording? Nico suggesting a podcast. That's a good suggestion. Anu agrees, that's great. Edwin thinks maybe an interview, but a few more people coming through with um, podcast. Yep, and the speakers are going to be James and Amar. That's great. Could be a TV show, says uh, Dr. Akil. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. What do you think the goal of the conversation that James and Amar are having 
might be about or what do you think the outcome might be? It could be a talk show, says Nina. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Naka says the goal might be religious tolerance. Yeah, that's a good idea. My is suggesting this could be to promote multicultural education. Um, RJ is saying something similar, promoting multiculturalism through charity and new saying the value of charity in life. Um, to share information, says Alexia. Uh, Annie is saying charity, Ivy, multiculturalism. Absolutely. Some really good ideas coming through now. All right. So I agree with you. I think this is likely to be a podcast or an interview. Um, the two speakers are James and Amar, that's right. And the goal is to raise awareness of Amar's charity work. Um, the outcome perhaps might be to inspire others to volunteer. Uh, so perhaps they will listen to the, the conversation and be inspired to volunteer, or perhaps as those ideas coming through from you were suggesting, they'll feel more positively about multiculturalism. Some of the words that might come through are uh, cook, support, volunteer, believe, belong. It, it, this exercise is not about getting this absolutely right. But what you are doing by just spending a couple of uh, minutes as we're doing now and in the test, maybe just a few seconds, thinking about the context is it starts to spark in your mind things that you know about this situation and starts to help you know what to expect in the conversation as we saw with the example with making a dental appointment. So this is a good habit to develop and uh, it's something you can do in any language although the thinking part and words that you think you're going to hear should be done in English to help you develop your English skills and you can expand it easily too. So before each conversation with a patient or the next time you need to call someone on the phone to arrange something or you're in a shop to purchase something, you can do the same quick stop and think. The world is a fairly predictable space. So although you don't know exactly what you're going to hear, your knowledge of the world can limit the options fairly considerably. And we'll look at that in more detail in the session tomorrow on listening part A. But for now, let's move on to skill two, which is knowing what you are listening for. And unless we are listening purely for pleasure, there's always an agenda behind our choice to listen to something, whether it's to learn something, confirm our understanding of something we thought to be correct or incorrect, or to take a required action. And being clear about why you are listening and what you are listening for helps you identify the information when you hear it. And again, a lot of this is assisted by language. So for example, um, if you're listening to the weather forecast covering the whole of the country, like Australia, for example, you don't explicitly focus on the recording while it covers other regions or cities, but you wait for signal words such as the name of the region or city where you live or signpost words that suggest the information you want to hear is about to be given. So for example, when the weather forecaster says moving to the south of the country, if you live in the south, you now know this is the bit that I need to listen to in detail. And in OET, it is the question that tells you what you are listening for. So for example, says his skin feels blank. What is the patient most concerned about? How does the patient react to the plan? What does Michael say about osteoarthritis of the knee? Like with the example of the weather forecast, knowing what we are listening to, so an adjective to describe skin, a patient's main concern, a patient's reaction, a statement about osteoarthritis of the knee, helps us while we are listening to filter the information into useful or irrelevant. 
We know, for example, if the patient says, I thought I'd be worried about X, that the use of the past tense plus a conditional means this isn't their main concern. Instead, we need to keep on listening for signposting language such as, actually what is making me feel most anxious, or I'm really concerned about how I'll, or I don't think I'll be able to manage. It may not always be an explicit match for the answer options, but it will be possible to make the connection. Let's try it out in another activity. This time I'm going to ask you to tell me what you are listening for in each of these questions, and I want you to try to be as specific as you can in your suggestion. I'm going to do the first one for you as an example. So here's the context statement and question. The ward manager is briefing staff, which would include you, about plain, planned man maintenance sorry, of the IT system. What is the alternative process staff must follow? So that's what you're listening for. What is the alternative process staff must, must follow? And I can imagine, just from reading that context statement and question, that I'm going to be listening for a type of IT process. And this might include a different means of logging in, or perhaps it might include recording entries in a different location. So that's what I can anticipate from reading the context statement and question uh, before listening to the audio. So you have a go at this one. Here's your context statement. During a handover, your colleague mentions Mrs. X didn't eat any lunch today. You go to talk to her. How does Mrs. X describe her appetite? So tell me in chat, what are you listening for in that audio? With that question and that context statement, what can you tell me about what you're listening for? Try to be as specific as you can. Perhaps tell me a general answer and then try to be more specific. Can you give me an actual word that you think um, the, the patient might use? All right, RJ is saying poor appetite. Uh, Lindsay is saying aphasia. Does that mean poor swallowing? I'm not sure. I'm not a medical person, but okay. Thanks for the suggestion, Lindsay. Uh, Dr. Dan saying poor. Nahid, decreased appetite. Menaka is saying about her appetite and food. Nico, perhaps cause of the lack of appetite. Um, Catherine, loss of appetite. AJ says the same. Uh, lots of people suggesting a poor appetite. Um, Alexis say, I'm listening for some description. Ah, dysphagia, that's poor swallowing, isn't it, I think? Yeah, D Dr. Akil says maybe feeling full. Uh, Luckness and Emmanuel both saying uh, nauseous might be what they say instead. Absolutely, really good answers. So these were my suggestions. We're listening for an adjective or phrase to describe appetite, as many of you suggested, a common word could be poor. Or perhaps she might say something like she isn't tempted by the food. So she, the food that is on offer isn't making her feel particularly hungry. Excellent suggestions. Here is another example. So the context is your manager has called you at home to request you cover a shift for a colleague. And the question is, do you want to accept the shift? What are you listening for? Um, so you're listening to this conversation um, between the manager and the care worker or the healthcare worker who needs to cover a shift for a colleague. Do you want to accept the shift? What are you listening for? What type of word? And can you tell me specifically a word that you think you might hear? Uh, Dr. Dan says maybe you might hear days or hours uh, as part of the call. Ivy saying maybe the time of shift. Uh, Manaka saying to swap shift. Haley saying it could just be yes or no. Yeah, absolutely. Anna saying you might hear can do that for you. Uh, yep. Um, RJ is saying maybe the word accept. George says when will be the shift. 
Amy saying maybe you'll hear accept or decline. Pantea saying I am able to cover might be what you hear. Um, Legia saying maybe you'll hear reluctantly accepting the request. Yeah. Uh, Emmanuel saying what's the offer? Will you be paid? Yep, very fair comment. George is saying, what is in return? That's another fair comment. Yes, I'm doing something good for you. What can you do for me in return? Um, yeah, absolutely. Lots of good suggestions. Chama is saying willing or not willing. Cuckoo saying maybe I'll say my pleasure or agreement. Yeah, so what you're listening for is a reaction, perhaps an emotion word or phrase. So for example, I'm prepared to. Um, it's inconvenient. So these are words to provide your reaction uh, to the offer um, and a way of responding to accept the shift. Very good. All right. So you can easily practice this within your everyday life and especially if you're living in an English speaking country. The next time you go to ask a question or in fact, whenever you hear a question being asked in person or in something you're watching, just take a few seconds to think about what's the answer I'm listening for? What do I imagine the person who's just been asked the question is going to say? Is it an adjective to describe a feeling? Is it an emotion? Is it a reaction? Is it a verb or a series of verbs to follow as instructions? What am I listening for? And then you will know when you hear that information, yeah, that's the information because you're filtering out. Perhaps they'll say something longer and then you'll suddenly go, yeah, that's the information that I was listening for. So the third skill is about making use of the clues that the speaker's voice and delivery give you about the meaning of what they are saying. And there are two parts to this, stress and intonation. As I mentioned earlier, English is a stress-timed language which means that the stress is placed on words or parts of words that are more important than others to convey meaning. A number of other European languages, as well as Thai and Arabic, are also stress-timed, but many languages, including Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and South Asian languages, are syllable-timed, meaning that each syllable is clearly pronounced. And I can give you a few easy examples to show the differences. Chocolate, vegetable, comfortable. In English, they are pronounced with stress timing. So one of those syllables is pronounced more strongly than the other. Chocolate, vegetable, comfortable. And in fact, the stress is all at the beginning of those words. But speakers of English from syllable stress languages are likely to pronounce each syllable distinctly. Chocolate, vegetable, comfortable. In OET, speakers will use stress to highlight the important words in their st statements. So, for example, feeling bloated a lot of the time, getting the occasional bouts of nausea, and feeling quite a bit of fatigue. Uh, or, I was able to start my own business. They also use stress to differentiate between different options that could belong together. So I was eventually diagnosed with cervical cancer. Working on your own pronunciation to make sure you are saying words and statements using stress timing will also help you recognize these words when you are hearing them because they will sound how you are used to them sounding. The other part is intonation. So English speakers use rise and fall in their voices for many things, to show if something is a question or a statement, to provide grammatical meaning, whether something is a main point or a minor detail, and how the speaker feels about what they are saying across the spectrum from angry to overjoyed. In OET, understanding the speaker's intonation helps you understand the audio and what's coming next. For example, by hearing falling intonation used for questions. But then you started to develop other symptoms. Hearing rising intonation to show uncertainty. It doesn't seem to be related to how much I drink. 
hearing falling intonation for statements. I get a bit short of breath sometimes. Let's try this activity to see how good you are at recognizing intonation patterns. So choose the correct option on the right for each sentence. Have you had anything like this before? Which of those intonation patterns on the right is correct for that statement you can see on the left? Tell me in chat, which is, is it falling or rising perhaps? And if you think it is falling or rising, which one is it showing? Mai is suggesting it's falling. Mm -hmm. Have you had anything like this before? For questions? Yep. Good, Haley says falling for questions. Yeah, absolutely. So the answer is it's falling intonation for questions. Here's the next option. You've had this before, haven't you? Is that rising or falling? And which kind of rising or falling is it? You've had this before, haven't you? Great, Edith is saying perhaps rising for um, uncertainty. AJ is saying rising for confirmation. Yeah, rising for confirmation, that's correct. So your the haven't you, the question tag is, you're asking for confirmation from uh, the, the listener. Here's the next one. It could be nothing. It could be nothing. Is that rising or falling? I think I'm still seeing the answers for the previous. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go. So um, AJ is saying rising for uncertainty. Lucky Pearl also saying rising for uncertainty. And Neela, uncertainty. Debbie and Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. They are rising um, for uncertainty. Now, the next two statements are going to be to do with pitch. So pitch means the... Um, uh, how high or low the voice is. Uh, so here's the first one. I didn't know that was a possibility. Is it higher pitch for excitement or lower pitch for anxiety? I'm going to say that one again because I think I actually did the wrong example. Sorry, here we go. This is the one for the answer that's coming up on the next slide. I didn't know that was a possibility. I didn't know that was a possibility. Okay, is that lower pitch or higher pitch? Unfortunately, I think I did those the, the wrong way around. So let me go to the answer. That one was lower pitch for anxiety or negativity. I didn't know that was a possibility. Now compare it with this one. I didn't know that was a possibility. I didn't know that was a possibility. Great, I can see the answers coming through now. You could hear that first one was lower pitch for anxiety. And the second one that I've just done was higher pitch for excitement or optimism. All right, we've got just two more. I'm going to listen to your heart. I'm going to listen to your heart. So this is back to rising or falling intonation. Is that example on the screen rising or falling? And what kind of... Um, rising or falling, is it? Mm 
Nahid says, a statement. I just falling for statement. Lucky Pearl falling for statements. Yeah. Yeah, this one is a statement. It's not a question. I'm going to listen to your heart. It's falling intonation for statements. And the last one, your mother has angina. Your mother has angina. Yeah, very good. AJ saying falling for certainty. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So as with skills one and two, and you might like to listen to these again after today's session to, to take in some more time and to, to pause and hear the differences between the, the different intonation. But you can easily practice this um, when listening to live um, people talking or when you're uh, listening to recordings. It might help you to close your eyes so you can really focus on the sounds that you're hearing. Try to notice when uh, words are getting squeezed and shortened. Remember back to that uh, information I told you about natural speech, but also how intonation is used to show the tense of the action, the speaker's feelings about it, and when they're, whether they're making a question or a statement. So the three skills that we've just discussed are going to be helpful in getting the score you want in OET and are things you can do very easily. And one good thing about listening over the other subtests is that it's easier to fit in listening practice around the rest of your life. You can listen during your commute to and from work. You can listen while doing household chores, except perhaps vacuuming. You can listen while exercising. You can listen before going to sleep. The main message, I suppose, is turning these possibilities into a regular routine and committing to listen to something in English during one or more of these periods of time every day or at least a few times a week. And just like your stomach, your ears need a mixed content of di a mixed diet of content, sorry. So think about what, well, what are your hobbies? There are now podcasts on every imaginable topic from cycling to gardening, to mums giving advice about life with their toddlers, beauty, science, crime, and a lot of them can be accessed free using an app, such as the ABC in Australia, the BBC in the UK, and PBS in America, as well as global providers such as Spotify and Apple. And by listening to topics that you enjoy, not only will you get the enjoyment by spending some time on a topic that interests you, but you're also broadening your vocabulary and familiarity with English and English speakers. Then, of course, there are TED Talks, which also contain every kind of topic you might be interested in and range in length from around five minutes up to an hour. So these are great ways to develop your stamina to listen. You could start with choosing short talks and increase in length until you're regularly listening to talks that are at least 40 minutes long, the time that the OET listening test lasts. Every few minutes, pause the recording and think about a summary of what you've just heard. And this helps you to remain focused while you listen and not to let your mind wander. Something else that you can use um, with things like TED Talks are the speed controls. So if you're struggling to understand the speaker at normal speed, you can slow it down, perhaps until you feel you've tuned into the topic and their way of speaking, and then you can increase the speed back to normal again. You can also practice listening to the news and Breaking News English is a website with lots of topical and current news stories presented for English learners. You can choose topics based on difficulty. So try level five or six for OET style difficulty. As well as listening to the recording for comprehension, each new news topic comes with activities you can complete, such as dictation, listen and spell, word pairs, to allow you to test just how much you are processing and comprehending. 
And of course, everyone knows about YouTube and the range of content you can find there. Make sure you include some listening for enjoyment, as well as listening that is more typical of OET recordings. And the UK has a large list of TV programmes based in hospitals around the country, following the healthcare professionals who work there. For those of you living in the UK, you can find such programmes in their daily free-to-air TV schedule. But for those who live outside the UK, YouTube has a number of episodes you can watch. And these programmes are great for modelling the way healthcare professionals speak with patients and colleagues and the colloquial language that they use and how that varies in different parts of the country. You can see on the screen now some examples of the programmes that you can find in the UK schedules as well as on YouTube. And if you're looking for specific OET listening practice, then all of this week we have a special offer on our new listening course. You can save 20% off the purchase using the code you see on the screen now and the link that we've put into the comments. The listening course includes detailed lessons covering the skills and strategies for each part of the test. And you can challenge yourself with brand new practice tasks, six part A's, 16 part B's and six part C's and review the transcripts and extended answer keys. So before we get into the final part of today's session, when I'm going to set you some goals for the rest of listening week, I want you to tell me the answer to the following statements that we've already discussed in this quick true or false quiz. So here is the first question. Tell me in the comments, is this true or false? Words can sound different in English when spoken in a sentence to when they are said individually. Is that true or false? All right, we've got a couple of trues coming through as the first options. Yes, true, 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 true. Excellent. So everybody is saying true. English is a stress-timed language, which means some words will be hardly pronounced or they might be joined with the word before or after it when said in natural speech. Statement two, before a recording starts, you cannot guess what the speakers are going to discuss. Is that true or false? You can't guess what the speakers are going to discuss. Great, lots of false, false coming through. A couple of trues as well. Um, the answer is false. Your knowledge of the word can, world, sorry, can actually help you anticipate a lot about what you're going to hear, just not the answers. All right. So you're not going to be able to guess the specifics, but you can guess what they're going to talk about. That was that exercise that we we looked at um, earlier in today's session. You you have a really good idea just from the context and the question what those people are going to talk about just uh, from reading that, that description. Statement three, deciding what kind of information you're listening for is an effective strategy. Is that true or false? Yeah, that's good. True is the right answer. If you know what you're listening for, so for example, you're listening for an adjective to describe the patient's skin, you're listening for the main concern that the patient has, then this helps you to filter away the information that doesn't give you this detail. All right, two more questions. Intonation can tell you how the speaker feels about what they're saying. Is that true or false? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's right. This is also true. So English speakers use the rise and fall of their voice to show their emotion about what they are saying. And the last statement, listening to healthcare audios is the best way to prepare for OET. Is that true or false? Well, this one really, I suppose, is a bit of a trick question. It's mostly false. So although listening to these things will help you with your preparation, the best approach is to listen to lots of different things and expose yourself to a broad vocabulary and range of accents. And it's also really important that you spend some time listening to things that you enjoy because then you'll enjoy listening and the more that you enjoy the listening the more you'll want to do it so a variety is definitely the best approach not just listening to healthcare audios so i'm going to finish this session by asking you to evaluate your current listening habits and committing to some goals to increase the amount of listening you're currently doing every day so first of all, I'm going to ask you to download this list of 10 questions about listening. We're popping the link into the comments now. And in the downloadable version, you'll find some explanation for each question, as well as some encouragement about why being able to answer yes to each statement will help you become a better listener. How many are you doing right now? Which ones can you start doing straight away? And secondly, I want you to set yourself some goals. How many minutes of listening are you going to commit to doing each day of listening week? And think about when are you going to fit these into your schedule? It's not enough just to say, I'm going to listen to this many minutes every day. You need to find time in your schedule when you can actually do it. So make, make some time to think about and commit to listening every day and also commit to trying something new. So for example, if you've never listened to a podcast before, uh, try listening to a podcast or choose a different podcast topic to something that you usually listen to. If your partner or family is up for doing this, try listening together and then discussing what you heard because part of the enjoyment of listening also comes from sharing um, the information with someone else. So my challenge for you this week is to answer those 10 questions and make a start on increasing the number you say yes to uh, and report back your progress on Friday. And don't forget the special offer is on all week for our listening course. You can save 20% off the purchase of the listening course using the code that you can see on the screen now. And for the next three days, we've also got some great giveaways. So make sure you come back for the next three sessions, um, which are going to be looking at different parts of the listening test. So I can see the wrong slide is up on there. So I'm just going to go back to this one. Um, we're going to be looking at listening part A tomorrow. If you haven't uh, seen the new sample test yet, you haven't had a go at answering the questions, we're putting the link into the chat now. You can go through the new sample test um, before the session tomorrow, having a go, particularly at part A. If you don't have time to do the whole sample test before tomorrow, make sure you do part A. And then we're going to go through all of the answers to the new sample test part A questions live in tomorrow's session. And we'll do the same for parts B and C on Wednesday and Thursday. So there we go. Listening week has started. Thank you so much for joining me for today's session. I hope you learned a few new tips and strategies for getting ready and improving your listening. And I look forward to joining you and going through those new sample test answers for the rest of this week. I will see you same time tomorrow. Bye for now.